I think everyone was coming into this year expecting $5 corn. And that was just the way it was going to be, you know. Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. As always, I want to remind you to like these videos, subscribe to them. You just click on that little bell icon right down below and we'll let you know when the new episode comes out and share these videos with others as well. My very special guest today, we have Eric Ralph with us and he is with Comstock Investments. And we'll take a look at the week of trade in the ag commodities. And Eric, you have to admit, when you look at Friday's close, things did not look very impressive. Uh, let's look at the grain side. First of all, I see a lot of red on the screen. Were you surprised at the extent on Friday? Uh, I was a little surprised that soybeans took back everything they gained yesterday. I wasn't surprised to see weakness early in the day. and It, it just kept bleeding off. Uh, so the, the weakness after a day like yesterday to end the week wasn't too shocking, but as, as far as they kept carrying it, uh, that was a little bit, uh, I was taken aback by that a bit. Now the corn held up fairly well today, given what the wheat, soybean, soybean oil were doing, but all in all, it wasn't a good finish to the week and doesn't have a good look with the next crop progress coming up on Monday afternoon. Did the nearby soybeans make a new low for the move? They did, the nearby did. I think this is a scenario where the November becomes the more important chart as well as the December corn. So November soybeans, December corn, I think they become a little more pertinent to the technical picture just because we are mostly trading the crop in the ground at this point. This is a weather market. The weather is going to mostly impact the, the new crop. Um, so I think those charts become more important. They did not make a new low for the move. And so there is something at least we can hang our hat on and hopefully we can get some kind of support out of Monday afternoon's uh, crop progress. Well, that was one thing. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, now that we're coming not too far from uh, delivery on the July contracts here, mm -hmm. at some point, everybody's going to have to roll over into future months here. So on uh, corn, you're looking at September as the nearest. Mm -hmm. On soybeans, you're looking at August and September. But you already mentioned that you said usually for all intents and purposes, everybody just goes all the way out to December corn and November soybeans. The the months in the middle, do they just get overlooked? Do they mean much or not? In the case of the soybeans, they do if the commercials will continue to work off of those contract months. Now, last year we had a scenario where the 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 pricing, the market situation warranted them going straight to the November at an early stage. So we briefly traded August and then went straight to November. Uh, in the in the case of the corn, you will have quite a bit of, of cash trade. Commercials will work off of the September. So that contract is a little bit more relevant. But unlike the soybeans, you don't have two in between there. So obviously that takes a little bit of the focus away. So yeah, there there is going to be a time period in here where those matter until we can start to get a better feel for what this crop in the ground is going to look like. You know, for a while, we talked about the connection between the wheat and the corn. And you mentioned a little bit ago that you thought corn performed performed fairly well here on Friday mm -hmm. in the face of the big selling in the wheat. So have they broken that connection now? I don't know that we can say that the connection's broken. It's just that we're not seeing, um, we're not seeing corn just drugged down by the other markets because it has a very different fundamental storyline. Ethanol grind's been good. The exports have been good. That's not been the case for the soybeans. Wheat exports are keeping pace with what USDA expected, but the USDA didn't have high expectations either. So that's something we have to keep in mind as well. Now, the, the, the corn export book looks great. In fact, I would think that the USDA would probably need to revise it a little higher again. We've already seen one revision. I, I think we could see another one. And, and there's just so much talk about the agronomic issues that we could have with this crop in the ground that I think that's going to underpin any real weakness unless we just get a technical slide that surprises us. And there are some technical markers we need to be looking for coming up here. So wheat exports for this past week were pretty good, though, right? Is they it were. just harvest pressure that's weighing on it or what's going on? I have to think that that's the bulk of it. I mean, we've talked to numerous people that are out on the run right now and they're seeing surprising yields and you're getting surprising yields in Turkey. Turkey's set to make probably the biggest carry in number that they've seen in almost 20 years. There's talk of Australia having a good crop. So it, it's in conjunction with a few other things. But all in all, I think you've got a lot of people looking for record yields domestically. And that's probably the biggest factor that is offsetting some of the bullish storylines that we're hearing out of Russia in particular. Yeah, we had talked about the, the dryness concerns in Russia and Ukraine, freeze concerns. Um, and I just wondered if that's all been alleviated 
I mean, are they to the point of harvesting now where it doesn't matter anyway? Well, I think it still matters because you have this situation here where now the the numbers are such that Russia is not going to be fire selling it anymore. Uh, there was talk that they were going to maybe put sanctions on and there was going to be limited exports, if not cut off completely. And, and I think that gave us a brief boost there. But intraday, we take that all back because the storyline quickly shifts to, well, we're not going to restrict it. We're just not going to be giving it away, basically. Yeah, they were going to raise their uh, their export uh, price level, right? For the mm, week. Correct. I don't know how that works in Russia. Maybe you can explain that. Well, it's, it's like anywhere else. If, if you're shopping cash grain, you have FOB prices. And in here in the U S we have two primary export terminals. That is the Gulf and the PNW. Although there is some grain that goes off the East coast as well, but those are the two primaries and the price is what the price is. And that's set by the commercials that sell the grain out of those locations. And it's not much different in Russia. You have a price that's set and you either have willing buyers or you don't. Unfortunately, they've been in such need of cash flow that they've been selling it at prices that were undercutting the rest of the world. And it looks like they're going to throttle back on that. Now we're already uh, over $250 a ton where they had been down close to 200 smooth just a few months ago. Well, what caught your attention in the grain markets in this past week? Anything uh, that you want to point out specifically that we haven't touched on right now? I think that the the biggest thing for me was technical in nature, and I want to kind of throw something up here to look at. I think the corn, you know, we talked about December corn being probably the most important technically. And, and when we look at what happened this week, we went right back and checked April lows here. We did make lower lows than what we saw in April, but not by much. And, and for all intents and purposes, that was just a test and hold. Uh, we saw that huge rebound yesterday, took some of that back today, but you can see we finished well off the low today. So it wasn't a catastrophic finish to the day. Uh, we did hold the lows for the week, which kind of aligned with those April lows. So there is something for technicians to hang their hat on. And you can see when you look at some of the oscillators that, you know, the RSI was at multi-month lows throughout most of this week, going all the way back to February and March levels. And so oversold holding lows that that's a decent little picture to me but we again it's all going to depend on be dependent on what we see monday afternoon and can the trade get a little follow through to the upside monday night into tuesday and of course monday's trade will set the stage for whether or not we can see that november beans were a similar picture we went tested these april lows we didn't quite get to them but got close enough to call it a good test there and Again, rebound yesterday, took some of that back today, but finished off the low. I, I don't like the front month look, but again, I believe that those first months of new crop are the bigger picture. July soybeans made a new low for the move today, finished back above the prior three days lows. So maybe we're at a spot where we're ready to hold this market now. Um, the other thing I would say is the, the macro picture today was, was unbelievable. Uh, gold lost over $70 an ounce. You can see the August gold down $72. Uh, go to the silver down $2 an ounce. Those are just massive moves in huge markets. And you, you never like to see that kind of thing because it just applies pressure to commodities as a whole. Uh, fund managers see commodities are in a losing situation. Let's pull our money and see if this thing's going to straighten itself out. And that's kind of what we saw today. So, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not the end of the world in some of these markets, but I, I also don't know that we have enough confirmation in the grain specifically to say that we're done with this slide lower. All I can tell you for sure is that the lows this week are significant and we need to see them hold next week. So the jobs data that came out Friday morning was uh, apparently better than expected. Is that enough to really send the gold over the cliff on Friday? Not really. Uh, that, that was the thing about this move today in the metals, particularly you saw metals and bonds, just massive liquidation, uh, huge drops in both metals and bonds. And it wasn't just like the gold or whatever. It was, it was everything. It was copper, platinum, silver, gold, and the bonds. And, and the dollar was higher. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't enough higher to constitute the moves that we saw. Typically, when you see those kind of moves in the metals and the bonds, you're looking for the dollar to be up 125, 150 points, and maybe the Dow's up 500 and the S&P's up 50. And today, I mean, 
the stock market traded either side of unchanged and you saw a 75 point move in the dollar. It wasn't enough to warrant the moves we saw in the other markets. Well, considering the big moves that we have had in livestock here for the past week on Friday, everything seemed really quiet, seemed mm -hmm. kind of uncharacteristic for the livestock market. Uh, what does that mean as we head into the weekend here? I think we just saw some short profit taking. I mean, you had feeder cattle down six, six sessions in a row. And coming up to the end of the week here, I think you just saw a little bit of short profit taking. Live cattle were quiet. I mean, they were just all but unchanged when you look contract to contract. And feeder cattle were a little higher. And I think that was just uh, some shorts willing to say, okay, I'll step out of here and we'll see what happens next week. So when you uh, take a look at the charts, by the way, do you have them available for the livestock here? I just wondered what you were looking at for support points on some of these here. Feeder cattle first, since I was okay. just talking about them. I actually hit support yesterday and today. Um, I kind of liked the 252 mark and pardon some of these lines. These are my own studies and some of them are old. So <laughs> you have right. to bear with me a little bit, but um, <laughs> you know, you could argue that you had, you had a close down here with a low here. So did we, are we holding trend line support? Well, when we look at a bigger picture and flip over to the weekly chart, then it becomes a little more apparent. Um, See if I can get rid of this here. Well, we'll just draw a new one. Uh, <laughs> weekly lows, you know, we're, we're basically that close on the low today. So we're, you know, we're within 40, 50 cents at the low today of what should be trend line support on the weekly chart. And, uh, you know, I kind of think that's something that you could trade. Uh, I, I, it did hold the last two days for the most part. So, uh, I, I think we're okay there. Um, in the live cattle, it's, it's a little bit different look, but all in all kind of the same scenario. Um, I don't like the steepness for live cattle to have this sharp uptrend on the weekly chart, but we are holding the trend line on the weekly here as well. And so it, we're, we're very near points. When you look at the lows from this week, that should be holding, obviously this week they did, uh, hogs, different deal. Uh, I don't, I don't know where the hope's going to come in for them. Although I, I guess I can say we had two sessions in the green here. I'm going to flip back to the daily. Um, so you finish the week with two sessions in the green, but looking a little longer term at this July contract, you know, you're, you're close enough. You're within $4 of these contract lows. Um, if those give way, we've got a real problem on our hands. So that's something we'll be watching going into next week, I guess. Uh, if, if you take that out, then you're opening the door back into the seventies, which we saw, um, earlier this year for a lot of these contracts. But then that kind of begs the question, if that would happen, would that act as an anchor on the cattle market? Then? There's not been a lot of correlation. It's almost been uh, the inverse. Uh, you've had at times when you've had cattle sharply higher, uh, you've had hogs sharply lower and vice versa. So I can't say that there's going to be a lot of correlation there, but it is peak grilling season and that's going to hold out for the next couple of months. And and so I would have to think that right now there should be a little more uniformity when you compare the hogs to the cattle. From what I hear, the only reason that we're able to keep up with supply for beef is the fact that the carcass weights are so heavy right now. Animal numbers are down, but uh, gosh, we're running over 30 pounds above a year ago, right? Yeah, the tonnage is is there. And and actually, there, you know, you you well remember a time when we would get penalized for carcasses being too big. Uh, we'd get deducts for it. And now they're, they're offering incentives for it uh, because the numbers are lighter. And so if they can make up the tonnage with larger animals, then all is well, right? At the end of the day, you're still moving just as much beef out the door. And so now you're starting to see the opposite of what we're used to. And, and these bigger animals are actually sought after because not only are they getting the tonnage, but typically when the animals are that big you're getting a higher level of prime beef so the percentages go way up the grading goes up and and everything works out better for them in the end although it's interesting right now some of the highest priced meat out there is the lean meat which a lot of it's pound bulls and cows and and they're just trying to scrap together as much lean meat as they can because 90 10 hamburger is the most expensive thing on the market when you look at a pound per pound basis. Well, given the market structure, the way it is on the uh, cattle futures right now and mm -hmm. the corn, how does that work out for profitability for the cattle producer now with the corn going down here lately? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're penciling. Well, I think everyone was coming into this year expecting $5 corn and that was just the way it was going to be, you know, 
Uh, but, and, and I'm talking about the board because in, in the, in the heart of feedlot country, they're still paying over $5 for corn. Uh, but the, the, I think everyone was penciling a $5 board and trying to figure out how to make it work and, and adjust their rations accordingly. And now you've got a scenario where we've hardly seen $5 this year. And so I, I think it's working pretty well, especially at these elevated prices. The problem is, is that they're having to spend so much money, uh, buying feeders that that's making up the difference. And so while it's still penciling, it's still got to be a pretty sharp pencil to get it done. Well, of course, next week we're coming up on Father's Day weekend. That'll be a fairly big barbecuing weekend, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, then the 4th of July. And I always consider the end of grilling season basically around Labor Day. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? When do we peak out the wholesale demand? for uh, things like beef and pork. As tight as we're running these numbers and as aggressive as the Packers have been, I'm gonna say that we're gonna be in a little bit of an abnormal situation. August usually is a quiet month as far as cattle demand for peak grilling season beef production, right? So usually by the beginning of August, you've already tapered off that cattle demand because they've already, they've already contracted or, or met their supply needs to get them through the Labor Day timeframe that you're talking about. Right now, you have a lot of stuff being bought on a two to four week delivery deferment, and they're picking them up in two or three days. Um, and so the the Packers are they're they're pretty close to the knife, and I think that that's going to probably remain the case given the numbers that we're seeing. I don't I don't think this early calf crop is going to make much difference by the time we get into July and August. And so I I, I really think this is going to be a deal where we're going all the way into second, third week of August before we start to see that demand taper off. Earlier in the podcast, you mentioned wheat harvest. We didn't really spend much time on that. Mm. But uh, I just wondered, as we get into next week, I would imagine they're going to be knocking on the door of Kansas by next week as the harvest moves northward. I know they've been kind of stalled out with wet conditions, right. but it's supposed to get pretty hot in the plains, right? Yeah, and and you know how that goes too. You know that you get the heat; that's one thing, but it usually is windy enough where you combine the two, and it doesn't take very long to dry out and get back in the field. Uh, you can have an inch of rain today and be working on Monday, no problem. Now. When I was in Kansas over Memorial Weekend, I made the comment to some relatives and friends. I said, I, I think we're only a couple of weeks away from needing to get combines out there. And everyone concurred. It, it's it's early and, and this thing's going to push through fast. And so the normal the normal times to make sales are going to be ahead of, of the count on, on the calendar. They're going to be ahead of normal. And so what we would probably be doing in early to mid July, we're going to be doing in two weeks. And so this is something from a marketing standpoint that has to, you've got to keep in mind because right now we're, we've already seen what a 50 cent setback after a 90 plus cent rally. Uh, there's likely to be some kind of a rebound after nine sessions in a row lower. Uh, I would think you'd get some kind of a bounce back and, and we've got to be ready to pull the trigger on some sales if we have things that we're needing to sell, if we have wheat to sell right away. So that's something to definitely be watching for. Traditionally, do you expect harvest pressure to uh, finally back off a little bit once you get to maybe, what, 70% complete on the season harvest? Generally speaking, yeah. There's there's a there's a window in there that, that kind of hits where you're over half done but not complete. And everybody wants to round up as much as they can to meet immediate needs. And so there's usually this this brief window in there where there, there's a real opportunity. Um, where we were at in Southwest Kansas, you know, fairly early in the season, we were harvesting, right? Yeah. As you said, they're going to be knocking on the door by next week. Um, and, and generally speaking by the third week, of, we, we were usually done with wheat harvest, had, had equipment serviced up, everything back to zero by the 4th of July. And so typically by the 25th of June, we were done. And in nine, eight, I shouldn't say nine, eight years out of 10, the right thing was to just sell off the combine, anything that you needed to move in the first six months, sell it off the combine and then wait uh, for the December timeframe. So that is all going to come a little early. And I, and I think to your point, you're going to have this window here sooner than later where you can get that done. All right. Well, good information. Thanks for sharing a little time with us today. Always right, a Marla. treat to get to talk with you. And thanks for sharing the uh, graphics too. Absolutely. Uh, very meaningful stuff. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. It's Eric Ralph of Comstock Investments. Uh, Eric, if somebody wants to give you a call personally and ask you more about the markets, how do they get in touch with you there? 
You can call the office at 712-227-1110, or you can send me an email at ericr at comstock.com. Eric R. Okay. Thank you very much. You have a good weekend. Eric Ralph with us. That'll do it for this episode, and we thank you for joining us. For producer Brianne Henriksen, I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.